You're listening to Women Leading Prevention Science, where we host candid conversations with some of the most accomplished women in the prevention science field. I'm Sarah Hairgrove, a public health analyst at RTI International and a master's in public health student at the University of Maryland. As I move through my early years as a prevention scientist, it's an honor to speak with these inspiring female leaders in the field. This podcast was developed as part of the NIH Helping End Addiction Long-Term Initiative, or the HEAL Prevention Cooperative. The views expressed in this podcast are those of the participants and not the official views of NIH, the NIH HEAL Initiative, NIDA, or the participating institutions and organizations. Today, I'm excited to introduce you to Jasmine Ramirez. Jasmine will be helping me co-host the second season of Women Leading Prevention Science. We're going to be talking about where we are in our educational journeys, how we ended up studying and working in prevention science, what we like to do in our free time, and our goals for the future. Jasmine, could you tell us where you're coming from and why you're interested in serving as a co-host on this podcast? Yeah, so I'm a um, third-year counseling psychology doctoral student at the University of Oregon, Um, and so I'm working there with my advisor, Dr. Beth Stormshack, who has a lot of different grants um, focused on kind of prevention, intervention. Um, And so I'm currently on like three different projects with her. uh, And actually one of our um, members from the research team um, is uh, part of the HEAL meetings, the monthly meetings. And she kind of heard about the opportunity of kind of being part of this podcast. And um, both of them just contacted me and said, hey, I think this is going to be a really cool opportunity. And I think just, I remember thinking, I don't know that I'm comfortable doing that. Um, but I think, you know, it comes with with that grad student um, territory where it's really hard to say no, mostly to your advisor. Uh, and so I was like, okay, what's something that I can say that is not no? I was like, well, I'll give it a shot. Um, but I am really glad that I did because once I spoke with you, Sarah, I was like, oh, okay, I like the sound of this um, and I think I can do it. So yeah, here I am. Yeah, we're really glad you were willing to give it a shot. I think I was also voluntold a little bit by a senior colleague to do this. She was like, Sarah, you'd be great for it. Let's start next week. Um, and we've dove right in. So I, I'm really glad that my experience could encourage you and show you that you are qualified for this. Jasmine, you said you're a third year in your counseling psychology program? Yes, that's correct. Did you start during COVID then, I assume? Yeah, actually. Um, so we interviewed right before, we actually still interviewed in person. Um, mm-hmm. COVID had not quite hit, so it was like in January, um, but we did get accepted during that COVID year. Um, and so when we started, that full first year was online. Yeah. Um, I think we had one um, class that was in person. And the only reason that we were able to do that was because my cohort only, it's only eight people um, Mm -hmm. and two who, you know, for their own reasons just couldn't show up. And so it was six of us. And so we were like pretty much like tables apart from each other. But I think we all were like, yay, you know, we get to see people off of a screen, Mm -hmm. um, even if it's only once a week. Um, But yeah, it was definitely quite the experience to, to start grad school um, online. I started my job with RTI online. I worked in person for a summer as an intern, but in a different role in a different department. And then I was hired full-time in, I think, June of 2020. And so started at the beginning of everything when it was remote and people also didn't really know how to be remote yet, um, which it sounds like your experience was similar, but I started a master's in public health program this past August. So I've been in that for a few months now and it's mostly in person, which I'm very thankful for. You just started grad school. So how's that going Mm -hmm. for you? It's going. Um, It has been, I'm glad to be a part of a cohort. I think that makes such a big difference and you don't really get that feeling in undergrad. Um, At least I didn't. I went to Ohio State University, which is a very large school. And so there were, I think, 9,000 freshmen my year which is good and bad in lots of ways. I mean, you, you're exposed to so many different people, so many different experiences. I think the opportunities are endless at a really large university in undergrad, but you don't get the feeling of, you know, being in it with other people. And you mentioned you have a cohort of six or eight people. So I'm sure it's kind of similar, but I think my health equity concentration is probably around 20 or 25 people. So I think it's been nice to feel like you're really going through something with other people. I imagine we'll have a lot of our classes together I've enjoyed that part a lot. 
Yeah, I think it's interesting you say that too. Um, so as 30 years, we get first year mentees. Um, and mm -hmm. that's just kind of, again, to pair people like incoming students with, with some of us who have experience and we'd like to say we have some wisdom. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, one of the advices that we always give is like, yeah, you have these like mentor mentee relationships um, coming in. And as great as that is, right, like the people that you really need to connect with are people in your cohort because they're mm -hmm. going to be here till the end with you, right? Like in two years, I'm gone and you're still here. So we yeah. always like to say like, it's so important to like find your person within that cohort. How long is your program? It should be two years. I should just be in it um, this academic year and then I'll have an internship next summer and then one more year and I'll graduate in May of 2024. That is the goal. I'm working full time throughout the program for as long as I can. Um, but if I find that I would have to start taking a lesser course load, I would probably go down part time and work. I feel really lucky to have been in public health for years before starting the grad program. And so I think a lot of this first semester is really geared at intro to public health. What is this field? What are we doing? What are the theories and the key players? And I feel very lucky to already know. Yeah. How long did you take between your undergrad um, and applying to your master's program? Um, it has been a little over two years. So I graduated in May 2020 and then started my grad program in August 2022. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's pretty common for people to take that kind of year to gain a little bit more experience. Um, I know I did. So what did you do during your gap year? Um, so during my senior year, um, I had professors who told me, you know, what's your, what's your next step? And I'm like, yeah, I don't know. I'm just trying to survive senior year, like end on a good mm -hmm. note. And they were like, okay, but we got to start thinking about like, what's next. They were both kind of just really pushing um, for me to apply to a PhD program. And it just wasn't mm -hmm. something that I had thought about. Um, and to put it into perspective, I didn't think about a PhD program um, at all, because I didn't really do any research during my undergrad. Mm -hmm. um, I was more into kind of the the community-based work, kind of just being out there, working with the people, and truthfully, really just, I didn't like research. <laughs> um, and so when they told me that, I'm like, aren't like PhD programs very research heavy? Like, I don't know. I don't even think I could get in because of that lack of, mm -hmm. of, of research experience. And they're like, no, but you could get in. And so one of the like bigger barriers for me was that I commuted to, uh, to college. Um, mm -hmm. I was living at home. Um, I was working in San Francisco, which had a higher wage than Moraga, which is where um, St. Mary's College is and where mm -hmm. I was going. For me, it was just really hard to get involved in, in some of these um, kind of research paths because they all happened, you know, after school or during times that I just wasn't around. Um, and when I kind of brought this concern to one of my professors, he said, well, you like the community, go out in the community and try to try to see what you could find. And I'm like, okay, that's probably not as easy as you're making it sound right now. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like the, I was actually just hanging out with some friends. Um, this new person had joined us and went in, sat with her and she goes, yeah, I work at UCSF with actually a lot of psychologists. And I'm like, <laughs> huh, that's cool. Like, you know, and I thought it was just going to be a conversation. Mm -hmm. Um, and she ends up saying, you know, like you, I, I want to introduce you to these two people. They're great. They're, you know, they have their kind of clinical practice on the side, but they're doing research. And I'm like, Oh, you could do that. <laughs> uh, and so she introduced me and I think it was, I just had the opportunity to volunteer and kind of see how things worked. But really my position was, um, like sibling support. Um, and mm -hmm. so kind of watching the kids that weren't participating in the study that they were working on. And I'm like, yeah, okay, you know, get your foot in the door. Mm -hmm. um, and so went in my first day expecting to sit down with a bunch of kids and playing some games. And that is not exactly what happened. Um, I was asked uh, if I was interested in learning how to score child assessments. And I was like, sure. Yeah, cool. Um, and from there, I just became a research assistant. It wasn't mm -hmm. like a like a very formal way of doing it, but it just kind of happened. And um, through that work, I was able to see just like the direct impact that research can have, um, mm -hmm. mostly when it is through these kind of familial interventions that were going on um, through these preventative measures, right? And I was like, okay, 
maybe research isn't that bad. Maybe I was just exposed to like a very limited idea of what mm. research is. Um, so yeah, I stuck yeah. with them for about a year and a half after graduating. And then I applied to grad school and here I am. <laughs> I think a lot of people can probably relate to that. I think it's a really helpful story for a lot of people. Kind of going back to the beginning, I also had to work throughout all of undergrad and now in grad school. And I think there aren't that many, or it can seem like there aren't that many resources or that many inspiring stories from people who had that experience. Um, people always talk about getting the unpaid internships or getting the volunteer positions or joining every club you can. Um, and attending every event at school. And I think that's not realistic if you have to work in the evenings or if you have a long commute. So I like to hear from people that also worked and also made it. Also hearing about, like you mentioned, getting your foot in the door and literally on your first day being pushed into a role that was not what you signed up for, but turns out maybe even better. Um, I think a lot of the experiences that we have in our early professional years do look like that. Um, I've had that a lot at RTI being a bachelor's level staff member, usually the opportunities you're given are naturally less than that of staff members who have their master's or their PhD or just really senior career folks. And I've been able to stumble onto projects with colleagues who just gave me opportunities way before I felt ready for them, um, such as co-hosting a podcast, but also things like leading interviews um, for qualitative research that I had studied qualitative research forever. I'd taken notes for qualitative um, interviews, but I'd never been the actual one interviewing. And sometimes people just extend you those opportunities. And when you take them, you might find out that you like research. It's really fascinating to see how those experiences kind of shape us in ways that we're not really planning on. Yeah, definitely, I agree. Jasmine, what do you do when you're not researching or hosting podcasts? All my free time goes to my dog, um, <laughs> who, you know, I, I rescued him um, when he was about eight weeks, and he's been re with me since. He turned three years old next week, mm -hmm. um, and he's actually being really good right now, and he's sleeping, so I'm just, like, not going to say his actual name. <laughs> I don't want to wake him up. Um, but, yeah, he's a very active dog. Um, Oregon's, like, such a beautiful place. We live like down the street from a bike path. And so mm -hmm. it's like along the river. Um, and so we go on walks um, there all the time, like hour, hour and a half walks. Um, we do a bunch of hikes. I think in the first year that I was in Oregon, I went to 15 different waterfalls. We do a lot of like Saturday picnics with my friends who have become very fond of him um, and who he loves. So mm -hmm. it's just like really good, good way to spend time and just decompress. What about you? I also have a rescued dog that it sounds like we got around the same time. Um, I got mine December 2019. Um, Stop. So did I. <laughs> what day? Do you um, remember? We literally got him a couple of days before Christmas. So <laughs> mine was December 21st. <laughs> I think it was like the 22nd. Yeah. That's hilarious. Okay. Yeah. We got our dogs on the same day. They're twins. But mine was older. He was, I think, around three or four when I got him. So he's around seven now but he's also big and here all the time. He's on the couch, like right out of camera shot right now. Um, but yeah, I try to, especially since he's getting a little bit older, we try to stay pretty active and um, get his steps in every day, so to speak, to keep him healthy. So that is a big part of my life. I live in the Maryland area just outside of DC, um, but there's a lot of greenery here also. We have a lot of really good walking trails and things like that. I was climbing before grad school a lot unfortunately have not been able to since grad school started but I have been a climber for years I'm deciding whether or not I can still use that title um, since I'm going to take a two-year hiatus but I like to cook a lot last year before I started grad school I tried to get out a lot of long recipes and things that I wanted to have a lot of fun cooking because I knew that again I wouldn't be able to for two years I'll be eating frozen food and meal prepping now so it was really fun to get really into cooking last year I think that's when kind of setting your boundaries mm -hmm. becomes really relevant. Um, and I say yeah. that because, yes, definitely. Last year, I was mostly eating frozen food. I wasn't feeling, you know, I wasn't exercising. I just wasn't feeling great. And I felt like, you know, parts of my job or my just overall work as a student and as a clinician were just not feeling as fruitful because I wasn't fully there. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, 
you know, you're going to have so many opportunities in grad school that like saying no again is going to become yeah. a really important skill. But um, I think for me, setting those boundaries has been super important. I just started the term, but I've been cooking at least three to four times a week, which is really good. Um, and I actually picked up cycling. My advice is make that time for the things that you enjoy, for sure. I think routines help a lot. I think it's it's good to start out as like a, you know, go to the class one time, see what it's like. But once you know that you like it, I think being able to integrate those routines of of going every Monday or of going every Saturday morning or whatever it is, I think that you have something to look forward to. You look forward to that time in your week that you get to rest or be kind of rejuvenated. I think that's really important. Um, and yeah, only being a couple months into my program, I am trying to find those routines. So I don't know what they'll be yet, but I'm hoping that I discover it this semester and not two years from now, because then it'll be over. <laughs> <laughs> at least, I mean, at least it's done in two years. You know, mm -hmm. I always, I'm like, oh, maybe, maybe a master's would have, would have been nice. <laughs> you know, just a quick little two year thing instead. It's like, I mean, a PhD program is such a, such a huge, I mean, even two years is a commitment, right? But like, mm -hmm. I don't know. I question my, my, my decision every day. And then I'm like, something happens and I'm like, oh, I really enjoy it. I do as yeah. hard as this may be. I really do enjoy kind of what I'm doing and what I'm pursuing. I always said um, when people would ask, like, if I was doing master's or if I was going to go on for a PhD, I don't think I have more than two years of school in me right now. I've been working just a regular nine to five, so to speak, for mm -hmm. enough time at this point that I love the idea of waking up and working and then turning my laptop off and being done with work at the end of the day and being able to do dinner or whatever it is and, and just not have to think about things that are lingering there for me. Yeah, I definitely miss working. Um, mm -hmm. And I feel like if I could, I probably still would. Um, mm -hmm. But I, it just, there's no time. I waitressed for years throughout mm -hmm. actually my entire undergrad. Yeah. But let that be a, I don't know, a glimmer of hope for anyone listening who's approaching school or in school now is that it does end eventually. Um, and then even if you go back for more, eventually you're done with school. But yeah, I think I like the work-life balance of the workforce um, a lot more than that of during school. Yeah. My dad, you know, every time I complain to him, he has this thing that he does where, you know, I'll complain to him and all I want him is to validate and tell me it's going to be okay. And he does the complete mm -hmm. opposite. What he tends to do is like, you know, yeah, it's hard now. You're struggling now, but think one day, like <laughs> one day down the road, like you technically will be able to schedule your own clients and honestly only work a couple hours a day if you want to. And I'm like, I am, but like, it's hard. <laughs> it's difficult. And, he's like, and he's just like, just ignores the fact mm -hmm. that I'm completely struggling right now. And I'm like, I just need you to, can I, I don't know. Can you tell mm -hmm. me it's going to be okay? And he's just like, eh, it's life, <laughs> but it's worth it in the end. I'm like, I'm going to call my mom now. Thanks. Bye. Bye. <laughs> I mean, he's not wrong. So you're pursuing um, a master's in public health, specifically in health equity. And you've mentioned that from your previous experience, um, your interest really lies within children and families that are affected by kind of the child welfare system. But mm -hmm. do you see yourself working with other kind of social work populations um, in the future? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know what I want to do yet, but I think I've been able to kind of identify the type of work I want to do and kind of who I want to do it with. I don't have the job title for it yet. Um, research has been a really good sort of foundation for, I think, whatever comes next. In my undergraduate degree, I um, had an internship with an alternative for foster care. It was really fascinating. I didn't know there were any, but this is an international program. They exist sort of all around the world. Um, and their goal is family-centered care and, when possible, reunification. It was a really big focus on, again, if needed, immediately removing the child, putting them in a safe household in the meantime, and partnering with the host family and the bio family and just walking alongside them, helping the bio family find a substance use treatment if that was what they were struggling with, helping them find stable employment if that's what they were struggling with, or stable housing, and really working to get the bio family on their feet. I think I was just so amazed by the structure of that program. And that really inspired, I think, a lot of what I want to do in the future. I like the idea of maybe working alongside, again, these social work populations, but with a different approach. And I don't know if that's policy or research or 
advocacy work, I don't know what it is, but an approach that tries to facilitate that systems level change, that family level change on a, on a broader level. From what it sounds like, you definitely have like your area of interest and um, definitely that, that like goal that you would like to have mm -hmm. for yourself in terms of how you would want to approach the kind of work that you're doing. I think my interest in general, like I mentioned earlier, was working with the community than with my research kind of exposure. It was more like trauma informed work, but mm -hmm. it was working kind of in this systemic with the systemic approach, this family systemic approach, um, and kind of seeing the role that parents have in mm -hmm. kind of adolescent well being. Um, and so that's what I came in with, right? It's like, I want to work with Latinx Spanish speaking families. I'm interested in interventions. What do you got for me? You know, yeah. and, and Dr. Stormshack is working on the family checkup. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm like, Okay, but I want to see it with Spanish speaking families just kind of come, came in like guns blazing. And she was like, okay, well, I just got this grant um, using the family checkup to use it with families who've had like opioid misuse or substance misuse in general. And so then that is what became my kind of diversity supplement. And mm -hmm. now we'll be using the Spanish version app and hopefully recruiting families that have that substance misuse and kind of just seeing how much of a risk factor that substance misuse mm -hmm. is and what can we do through a parenting app, through coaching that can help kind of reduce that risk that, that exists with parenting and, and substance use. What do you think you want to do once you get your PhD? Do you have any idea what's next? I feel like it's always changing. I think my mm -hmm. ultimate goal has remained the same. At the end of the day, I do want to provide bilingual mental health services to underserved communities. Um, I want to be out there and kind of try to reduce the, the health disparities that mm -hmm. do exist within the Latinx community. People will ask you, what's the, what's like, what's your ratio? Like, is it going to mm -hmm. be 50, 50, like research and clinical work? Some people throw teaching in there right now. I feel like it'd probably be like 60, 40, um, where clinical would be a little bit uh, more on that 60 mm -hmm. side and research would be on that 40 side, but I think finding that balance will be something that I won't know how to do until I do have that PhD. You make a good point with the ratio. I feel like that is always the, the question. Most jobs are a lot less singularly focused than we think. Even doing research now full time, a lot of my work is still project management. A lot of my work is like financial management. Um, a lot of my work is also kind of mentorship to other staff members. And then Again, a ton of it is research. So I think I'm also curious what balance I'll end up landing on when it comes to the, the research or the policy work or the advocacy work or whatever it is that I do one day. I'm three years in and I feel like that kind of balance, that, that percentage mm -hmm. always changes. So mm -hmm. we'll figure it out. I'm, I'm very yeah. hopeful for the two of us. We'll, we'll get there. We got this far, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everyone figures it out eventually. Thank you, Jasmine, for taking the time to speak with me today. I'm excited to co-host the second season with you. And thank you to our listeners for joining us for Women Leading Prevention Science. We hope you enjoyed this episode and that you'll continue to join us as we host candid conversations with some of the most accomplished women in the prevention science field. We hope you'll share this podcast with your prevention science colleagues and with any young women you know that may be interested in pursuing a career in science. The HEAL Prevention Cooperative is funded through the NIH HEAL Initiative, an aggressive effort to speed scientific solutions to curb the national opioid public health crisis. The HEAL Prevention Cooperative includes 10 research projects throughout the country and one coordinating center based at RTI International in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina. For more information on the NIH HEAL Initiative, please visit heal.nih.gov.